Hey guys, the following episode was pre-recorded when I was still publishing this podcast on the Beyond the Kill podcast network. Due to some creative differences, we're no longer going to be working together. So you may hear a couple references to their show throughout this episode. Just disregard them. If you want to watch or listen to this podcast, just search The Mindful Hunter in any of your favorite podcasting platforms and you'll find me there or look for me on YouTube. Thanks. Enjoy the episode. All right. I'd like to welcome you back to episode number two of The Mindful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Jay Nickel. Now, before we get into today's podcast, I want to give ready some context and background where you can find uh, the podcast, where you can find me, depending on what particular platform you're listening to this or watching this right now. So for starters, this podcast is part of the Beyond the Kill podcast network. So if you search for Beyond the Kill on your favorite podcast platform, you will find my show within their stream, a show within a show, if you will. Secondly, you can watch this on my YouTube channel, which is mindful underscore hunter. You can follow me on Instagram, mindful underscore hunter. You can go to my website, mindfulhunter.com, or you can email me at j at mindfulhunter.com. Any of those methods of contact are, are appreciated. So I'm going to get into some things later on where I may, you know, ask for some feedback or we may have some Q and a episodes in the future. And if we do have those, you can email me your questions. You can DM me your questions on Instagram, either of those methods, neither one's preferred doesn't matter to me. So we're going to cover two main topics today. I'm going to give you a breakdown of my plan for 2021 hunts. And I'm also going to get into a gear review. And this is the first of this style of gear review that I'm going to be doing on the channel. And I'm calling it a gear shootout. And what I've done is I've picked a number of items that have similar items. And I've used both items extensively. And I'm going to do a head-to-head -head comparison. So today, we have the Obsidian Pants by First Light. And we have the Sitka Apex Pants, obviously, by Sitka. I've worn both of these pants a ton, especially this year and last year. Um, and I have some very firm opinions on which one I like and why. Um, and just to get this out of the way right now, any of the gear that you see or hear reviewed on this channel, I've bought with my own money. I give you my word. If anybody ever does, you know, give me free stuff to review, I will tell you that's how I got it. And the only circumstances under which I would take free gear is that if I'm allowed to say whatever I want about it, if there's any type of qualifications that I'm only allowed to give a certain type of review, I have no interest in free gear from companies like that. If I'm interested in something, I'll go spend my own money on it and I'll run a head to head comparison. And then I'll let you guys know which one I prefer. So we're going to do this gear shootout and I'm going to get into the 2021 hunt planning so that if there's anything about those hunts that you guys are curious about, you can drop me a line now. So as I start doing the individual hunt prep episodes, I can make sure to include any particular information that you guys, uh, that could be helpful or beneficial for you guys. So with the intro out of the way, we're going to dive into our weekly sections. Like I outlined last week. So the first one is training update. Um, I'm recording these a couple a week for the first few weeks so I can get a bit of a, a back catalog so that in case something comes up, um, I'll have a couple spare episodes kicking around so that I can reliably get one to you guys every week. So that being said, I just recorded the first podcast three days ago. My training hasn't changed a whole lot. I'm still doing a five-day split uh, with two days off, kind of three days on, one day off, two days on, one day off rinse and repeat. I thought what might be beneficial today is to give a little talk on the concept of progressive overload. So if working out or training or physical fitness in general is of zero interest to you, then skip ahead for the next five to six minutes. However, even if lifting isn't your thing, which is predominantly where the term progressive overload is used, I think it'd be beneficial to listen to the next few minutes because you're going to be able to apply this principle to any type of training that you do. So let's set the stage a little bit. There are several different mechanisms that people use to hypothesize how muscle is built and endurance is increased. Two of the most popular ones are progressive overload and time under tension. Progressive overload in its simplest context simply states that you need to put a muscle 
under a series of progressively harder overloads in order to introduce a novel stimulus, thus forcing novel growth. So let's get rid of all the $10 words. What does that mean? You got to pick up something heavier tomorrow than you picked up today if you want to tell your muscles to get bigger. And this can happen on a very small scale. Like for me these days, it's like one more rep. I log all my workouts and on my, all my major lifts, a success for me is walking into the gym, whatever two or three main lifts I'm doing for that day, getting one more rep per set on my two top sets for each of those exercise, or maybe going up by five pounds. Unless we're talking about something like a hack squat, which maybe I'll go up by like half a plate. I've been working out for a long time. I'm pretty close to my potential. So I, I, there's not a whole lot of, of shift there anymore, but the whole idea of progressive overload. And the reason why I want to introduce this to you guys who might not even really be focused on lifting. And let's talk about time under tension as well, because these are kind of complementary mechanisms. A lot of schools of thought would, would tell you one is superior over the other. I don't think you need to be in one camp or the other. I think you can actually use these principles in conjunction with each other. So first, let's look at progressive overload. So if I want to increase hypertrophy, if I want to increase my body's ability to build muscle, I need to pick up something heavier. I can apply this same principle if I want to be able to hike farther. Um, I need to hike, either put more weight on my back, or I need to reduce the amount of time it took me to hike the same distance. No matter which vector you're looking at, whether that be speed, time, or difficulty, you need to be constantly increasing this every time you train if your desire is to force a novel response. Remember, novel stimulus produces a novel response, which means something new has to happen for you to tell your body to do something new. If you go out and do the same hike every day, three days a week with the same weight on your back in the same amount of time, you will be creating no new response because there's no novel stimulus. You're essentially just going to get really good at doing that one hike in that one time with that much weight on your back. It will not translate to actually increasing your cardiovascular capacity or your conditioning. So if you want to get better, you got to work harder, do it faster, do it with more weight, do it longer. Um, by implementing this, this progressive overload or this progressive series of increasing difficulty, you will force your body to adapt and you will get, you will get better and you will develop more muscle. You will develop more conditioning. Um, your cardiovascular response will increase. Um, and you can apply this to anything that has to do with hunting. You can apply this to shooting. You can apply this to archery. You can apply this to glassing. You can apply this to training. Um, you can apply this to studying about animal behavior. I apply it to everything in my life. If I'm not, another way to think about this is your comfort zone, okay? If you are not pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, at least mildly, you are not creating a necessity for your body to increase its capacity, period. So that's just a real general principle that I think can be applied cross-functionally to um, multiple dimensions of, of the hunting space. Um, so that's why I wanted to give it a couple minutes. Now, the other one that get talked about a lot is time under tension. Now, the reason that I think these are complementary is that the principle of time under tension is based on the fact that the more time a muscle is placed under tension, the more response that muscle will need to produce. So this is why, this is where the higher rep um, schemes come from. Like you could have heard a training system that would be like, like a high volume rep system would be like, you're going to go in and do chest. You're going to do six exercises for chest. You're going to do four sets for each exercise. And you're going to do 12 to 15 reps per set. That would be considered moderately high volume. Now, if you took none of those sets to failure, but you were increasing the amount of time that that muscle was under tension, time under tension would still say that you would have a muscular response. So this is somewhat contradictory to um, progressive overload. 
However, there's different mechanisms for muscle growth. And remember, we're using muscle growth as an analogy for any type of training adaptation or increase in performance across everything that we do in the hunting space. So there are several different mechanisms that can force a muscular response. So it's possible that both of these are true. Both progressive overload and time under tension are true. I've been training for a long time. I can say that I've tried various training methods and at different point, points in my life, different mechanisms worked better for me, but they both are valid. So we can also utilize this principle to increase the efficacy of our training. Because again, if you think about, so when you're actually calculating the time under tension for a muscle, it is literally any time that that muscle is, is accomplishing any form of work. So if you're doing a dumbbell chest press, it would literally be that whole rep range, even when you're at a full stretch. So it would, it would ostensibly be from the moment you pick up the dumbbells while you are repping, you are under tension. So you'd be calculating that as time under tension. The analogy here with hiking is that while you are hiking, you are placing your body under tension. So you, the longer that you hike, the more response you're going to have. Progressive overload versus time under tension is an, basically an argument between intensity and volume. Progressive overload would argue to go for intensity and to failure, regardless of how long it takes you to get there. Time under tension would argue that the longer you're going to stay under tension, so the longer you can hold off from hitting failure, the better response you're going to have. So I guess my ultimate piece of advice is utilize both of these mechanisms. Let's take backpack cardio, for example. Some days, try and go as long as you can on a slight incline with a moderate weight. That's going to hit your time under tension. Other days, go to the stairs with a 50-pound pack and sprint up them sons of bitches. You're going to hit failure really, really quickly. But these two mechanisms are going to drive a muscular response through different vectors. So... Anyways, I have a feeling like that was way too nerdy for a bunch of the people listening, but I think that if you can be more, let me back up a sec. I am personally fairly frustrated with the amount of people taking advantage of the hunting space with these like 30 days to elk fit programs. The vast majority of them are bullshit. I've taught CrossFit. I've competed in CrossFit. Um, you do not need to do CrossFit to kill an elk. In fact, the two activities could not be further apart from the, from each other and have next to nothing to do with each other. Now will doing cardio, will doing CrossFit increase your, your overall general cardiovascular conditioning? Yes. And if you do that, would you then have more endurance for the things that you do elk hunting? Yes. However, there's such a principle as sports specific training. This states you want your training to be as close to the activity that you are executing as possible in order to produce the most efficacious response. That being said, you want to get better at killing elk, do the shit you do when you kill elk. Don't do, you know, cleans and jerks and, and snatches and all the rest of it. Cause it has nothing to do with shooting a bow or shooting a rifle or walking around in the woods. You want to get better at hunting, put weight on your back and hike up a mountain because that's what you do when you hunt. And it infuriates me that people are taking money from people for these programs that like are so basic. So what I'm trying to get across the audience is like, you don't need any of this shit. Just think intelligently about what it is you want to accomplish and then create training programs that emulate that. It's super simple. Anybody with a backpack and access to rocks or sand can train to hunt. You don't need any of these fancy programs. And I guess my ultimate goal with this podcast is to increase the level of self-sufficiency throughout the entire audience. And whether that have to be with what you're going to eat while you're hunting or how to train for hunting or what to do with an animal after you killed it or how to plan your year and the things you can do for your wife so she's more okay with you being gone more of the time, all of it is on the table. I want everyone to get better at all of those things so that you can all spend more time hunting and be more successful when you're out there. Anyways, that's enough of a rant on that. Diet update. As I said, I did my other podcast three days ago, so my diet is exactly the same. Now, 
As I mentioned last week, I am getting ready for a bodybuilding competition at some point in the future. I got about nine months to go so far. Actually, it's more like seven. It's creeping up. On that note, I do have a coach. So I send pictures to my coach every week. He sends me a new diet every week or tells me to do the same thing I was doing last week. I'm going to get more into that as we continue along that process. But one note that I wanted to make on this podcast was that if you want a thing to improve, start to measure it. If you want to improve your body composition, start measuring your body fat. If you want to improve your hiking times, start timing yourself. If you want to improve your lifts, start logging it. There's several academically verified principles that validate the fact that if you pay attention to something and measure it, the performance will increase. That's half the reason I have a coach. The other half is that measurement needs to be objective. When it comes to me looking at my own body, I'm not objective. I always think I look like shit. I need a third party who's objective and isn't emotionally invested in the outcome to say, ah, you're looking pretty good. I think we can up the food. Eh, you're getting a little pudgy. We're going to ramp up your cardio and we're going to knock your food down for a couple of weeks. We need to tighten everything up a little bit. So the takeaway here is measure what you want to increase and have some form of objective feedback that's not up for debate or vulnerable to emotional bias. As far as the actual diet update goes, I'll get back into that next week because I just gave my pictures today, so I should have a bit of an update. I'm just getting into a bulk now, so things should start ticking along here really quickly soon. Okay, this next section is called new gear. So this is where I'm just going to pick something at random that showed up this week um, and start talking about it. And if you're if you're watching this, I'm going to I'm going to show um, what I'm doing. So if you're particularly interested in this, you can always hop on over to the YouTube version and see what I'm about to actually talk about. So this week. I would like to, you can probably hear the jingling in the background. These are black diamond saber tooth crampons. Now I have never owned crampons before, so I had to do a ton of research. I've never, I've never owned them. I've never worn them. I've never done anything with them. So I'm super intrigued. Obviously I went a little bit overboard and probably could have got away with a slightly cheaper model. There's essentially three types of crampons you can buy strap in hybrid and like the pro or clamp on versions. This, your, your choice is limited by the boot that you have on your foot. Most boots will have a heel welt. That's that like little shelf of rubber on the heel that this back clip of the cramp on clips down into and holds your boot secure into the cramp on. What most boots don't have is a toe welt. So if a boot has no heel welt and no toe welt, you got to buy a strap on. If your boot has a heel welt, but no toe welt, you can get away with a hybrid. And if your boot has a heel welt and a toe welt, then you can wear like the pro clamp on ones. I am wearing for the goat hunt that I will get into in a few minutes, the La Sportiva Nepal GTXs. These are like a purebred mountaineering boot boot. So they have both the heel and toe welt. So they are compatible with these cramp ons. Plus I have gigantic feet. I'm wearing a size 14 boot. So I was limited in my selection and I've already tried these on and these do really, they fit um, very well. Um, I'm super impressed with how well they fit. So there's a little primer on crampons. I'm going to dig in more to this when I get back from the goat hunt because I don't really have a whole lot to talk about yet. Um, seeing as I have zero crampon experience. I will say that these things look super badass, um, and the boots are already amazing boots. So you put slap these things on the bottom of them and you feel like you could, you could walk up Mount Everest, which is obviously what some people choose to do with them. But anyways, there's the new piece of gear for the, for the week, black diamond saber tooth pro crampons. I'd love to hear back from you guys. Anybody who's run crampons, had good experiences, bad experiences, what you liked, what you didn't. Um, again, you can DM me on Instagram or shoot me an email, j at mindfulhunter.com. Um, and I, I'm super interested in having that discussion. So there you go, new, new piece of gear for the week. So the current event that I wanna get into this week isn't even necessarily super current. It's been kind of going on over the last couple months. And this has to do with the Bomars and the charges that they're facing for... They've been, uh, they've been accused and charged of poaching. And I can't remember if they have 17 or 34 different counts. And it's, it, it really boils down to a bunch of baiting 
which is illegal in Nebraska. And, oh, and I think Sarah shot some turkeys and didn't have a tag. Now, all of this is alleged. Could be none of this happened. Could be all of it happened. I have no clue. What The discussion that I want to have is, and I'm interested in feedback from you guys on this. Do you think conservation officers in general pay more attention to hunting personalities, whether that be TV, uh, written, or social media, than they do to normal people? And if you do think they pay more attention, is this warranted? Um, I find this very intriguing because, I mean, we hear about it quite regularly. I mean, here's the other part of this that I find intriguing. Once you put yourself in that spotlight, you feel a certain amount of pressure to produce. And I'm not going to say who's done it or who hasn't done it, but I can definitely understand the mentality that would influence somebody to make a less than ethical decision because of the pressure that they felt. I mean, that's what ethics are. It, you know, what do you do when no one is looking? And, you know, when pressure is applied, do you hold firm to those or are they malleable? I can tell you, since I've started filming my hunts for YouTube, I definitely feel a new sense of pressure. I feel like I've gotten over it um, because I've released a few films where I didn't kill anything. And once you've done it and you get really good feedback and people really like it, it's like, yeah, it happens. This is, and I'll get into this later. This is one of the reasons why I've chosen to really get into very hard technical hunting where there's like mountaineering and I'm solo. And cause to me, that's already a compelling story. I'm interested about dudes who are going to crazy places and going and doing crazy things. Even if you don't bring home an animal with you, that's still an interesting story for me. Most of these people got popular for knocking down big shit. And when you're not knocking down big shit anymore, are you going to maintain that level of popularity? And are you going to compromise your ethics in order to continue to knock down big shit? I can see it happening. I don't know many of these people, so I'm not, I can't comment on anybody personally. I read the entire charge sheet. I will say this much. There is a lot and you can, you can Google it. Um, a couple people have it posted on their Instagram page. I'll try and find a copy of it and link to it in the show notes. The thing's like 30 pages long. They've got video recordings and audio recordings. I mean, again, it's alleged. I'm not going to have, I don't have an opinion on it one way or another. I personally don't really give a shit about the Bomars. I don't like them. I don't not like them. They don't really enter into my universe. I don't follow either of them on social media. I don't really care that they exist. What is intriguing to me is this like sociological examination of motivations and people's behavior. So I mentioned in, in the previous podcast, I'm a business consultant. Technically, I'm a behavioral specialist or a behavioral strategist. So I get paid to kind of figure out why people do what they do and how we could design services to better serve individuals and how they tend to behave. So this is fascinating to me. But anyways, that had come up in my feed the last couple of weeks, what's going on. And I'm very interested to see how this plays out. So again, do you think conservation officers pay more attention to people who have some type of notoriety or popularity level? And if you think they do, do you think it's warranted? Do you think they're more likely to, you know, fudge the rules a little bit than the rest of us common folk. Anyways, food for thought. Let me know your thoughts. Okay, let's jump right into the gear shootout. So again, we're going to do the first light obsidian versus the Sitka Apex. So again, if you want to see what I'm holding up, hop over to YouTube. Here is the pair of the first light obsidian. This is a pure merino. I should be careful with the term pure merino. I think it's like a 37.5 or a 17. 0.5. Um, so it's 88% merino. So 12% is made up of nylon, polyester, and spandex. But it feels like a merino. It do, it's not stretchy like a merino top. It's more, it feels more like a non-stretchy cotton pant. Um, this is their second iteration of these pants. I can't remember. I had the first ones. 
And I liked the fit of the first ones better. And I can't remember what they were called. Anyways, I loved the idea of a Merino pant. And at the, when I first got these, they were the only Merino pant out. I love the idea of a Merino pant for a couple reasons. Um, the lack of scent is nice. Although if you're going to big game, Western big game hunt, you got to play the wind anyways. But on day five, not smelling like a sweaty ass to, to your campmates or yourself is kind of more of the benefit than the animals. And, um, it's quiet. Like if I hold these right up by the mic, it's going to sound like they're loud, but they, they make almost no noise when you walk in them. I've never had a quieter pair of pants. Um, they breathe really well. I don't tend to get cold legs. At worst, I will wear a very light long john. I rarely wear heavy long johns unless it's going to be for a long glassing session. So I prefer a lighter bottom wear. Um, I'll wear my heavier stuff up top. I will also say there are complementary top systems to both of these particular lines that I'm not going to get into today because the apex top doesn't really have a perfect analogy in the first light line. And you'd have to look at like two or three potential tops. So it's not really a fair comparison. And I'll just be honest. The Sitka apex top is such a innovative piece of gear. First light doesn't have anything that can compete with it with the built-in face mask, with the elbow pads and, and all the rest. When you need that piece of gear, first light doesn't have anything that's that effective. So it's not really fair to first light. So I like that they're light. I like that the scent um, stays down. I like the fact that they're quite breathable. I've, I've hunted in Arizona two years with these pants. Um, there's a lot I like about these pants. Here's what I don't. They're not durable at all. Um, this is my third pair of these pants under warranty. So they've been replaced under warranty twice. I have got a maximum of 20 hunting days per pair. And then they blow out. And what happens is the ass. And I don't understand why they haven't just put some, like some more reinforced material back here. Like you see in a lot of other pants, but essentially the, 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 the seat and the crotch area just disintegrates into nothing. And you can watch it get thinner and thinner and thinner. And then one day you go to put on your pants and you're just looking at skylight through your crotch. They're about 185 bucks us. The Sitka apex are 229. So that's, you know, 40 more bucks. It's an extra almost 20%. So there definitely is a, is a cost savings to go with the first light. I will also say there's not much give to the fabric and the cut is not particularly athletic. So it kind of feels like you're wearing just these wide shapeless pants and hunting. I'd, I'd rather something a little more snug is less to catch on, less to rub on and make noise. I just feel more athletic in general, which is why I like most of my pieces of clothing to have, um, some stretch built into it. I will say that the first part of my, uh, hunting career, I was a pretty diehard first light guy. Everything that I owned was first light. And I'm just going to be honest. I was just a victim of marketing. The hunting personalities that I really respected all wore first light and the camel pattern for BC where I live. I still feel like first light fusion is one of the best camo patterns that there is for a variety of different terrains. So because of that, I wore almost exclusively first light that's changed. Now I look, I do my research per piece and it's kind of agnostic of brand. I don't give a shit. If I want a puffy jacket, I'll examine the five or six puffy jackets from the top five guys and I'll make my decision. I don't really care what the camo is. Um, I care about the technical specifications of the gear. I also don't really care what it costs. If I want nice gear, I'm willing to pay for nice gear. The reason that I'm saying that is that I don't have any reason to bash First Light. I think some of their products are extremely good. I cannot give this particular pair of pants a recommendation simply because the ass blows out way too fast and the fit is less than ideal. Um, so for that reason, I wouldn't buy them, man. Save your money. Go buy something else. First Light Obsidian, peace out. Up next, Sitka Apex. This is Sitka's first attempt at Merino pants. As far as I'm aware, I think the, the top might even be their first um, 
Marino top. That I don't want to stake my reputation on though. John Barclow is not a big fan of Marino and he's the big game product manager. And he's not a big fan of Marino for several very good reasons. That dude is as legit as legit gets. However, he does see the purpose or the, um, he does see an opportunity to have it in your kit in specific places. So I think that's why he finally, you know, spearheaded the development of this apex system. And I'll be completely honest, as I talked about last week, I went and did an Alberta mule deer hunt this year. And in preparation for that, I listened to all the podcasts I could find. And there was a podcast that John Barklow and Aaron Snyder did on Kafaru cast, just basically tearing down their gear selection for a full hour. Like it was brilliant. And John was wearing the full apex system. He went into why that was such a great system for that particular hunt. I needed some new pants anyways. So I decided to give it a try. This is the first piece of Sitka gear I've ever bought. I was a little hesitant. The knee pads tripped me out. I thought I was going to take them out right away. I wasn't sure how the fit was going to be. I will say I like the subalpine camo pattern a lot. I find it's very versatile. I've used it in the prairies in Alberta. I've used it elk hunting in the Rockies. I've seen pictures of myself in both environments, and I feel like it's a very successful camo pattern. As much as that matters, I'll be honest with you. If you are broke and on a budget and you are just getting into hunting, go look for clearance sales at like uh, Mech or REI, or if you're in Canada, go to the last hunt, which is the clearance website for altitude sports and buy mountaineering gear that's on sale. Cause it's going to be way cheaper. It's going to function as good, if not better. It's just not going to have a camo pattern. And it's way more important than you're in technical gear. That's going to keep you warm and keep you dry and keep you functioning in the, in, in extreme circumstances than it is to have a camo pattern. That's kind of like a last ditch response. Anyways, you should not be depending on your, the pattern of your camo to aid in the success of your hunt. It's almost like a little backstop. Like, oh, if I fuck up, at least I've got this camo on. Maybe he won't see me. That being said, I really like this camo. So how do I talk about these pants without just blowing smoke up Sitka's ass for the next 20 minutes? I, I essentially can't. These pants blew my fucking mind. Um, they're phenomenal. I have nothing bad to say about them. Now, to be clear, I use these for 10 days in Northern British Columbia, and I use them for another six days in Alberta. So I've only worn them in the field for 16 days so far. So take it with a grain of salt. That said, there is zero sign of wear. I mean, zero. Now, because they are a Merino blend, there's been some buffing. So the colors have lightened up a little bit, but it hasn't degraded the fabric in any way, shape or form. The fit is outstanding. Here's the thing. I'm a pretty athletic guy, but I'm also big. I'm 6'1". I'm 253 pounds as of this morning. Um, so I have thick legs. I got an ass. I got big calves. Um, so fitting pants can be a bit tricky, but the Sitka fit is phenomenal. Little bit tight in the calves to get over my pack boots from Schnee's. That's the only thing that's a little bit the cuff. But the whole point is, these are designed for archery hunters. So they have a small cuff so that it stays close to your boot and you have less likelihood of ripping something, tearing something, or making noise as you brush past on something. Um, so I understand why they did that. The only thing on these pants that annoy me is the dual zipper. I have no idea why anybody puts in a zipper that you can pull up from the bottom. doesn't make any sense to me. And what I constantly do is I pull the top zipper down. I take a piss. I grab the bottom zipper. I pull it up and my zipper's open. So <laughs> I, I just don't understand the purpose. So I always have to make sure I'm pulling the appropriate zipper up. That's the only thing I can think of that bugs me about these pants. The knee pads blew my mind. I never, and I will say the same thing about the elbow pads in the apex hoodie. That thing blew my, those blew my mind. I, I wasn't expecting those to be as useful as they were, but it just all of a sudden occurred to me that I was never getting wet knees. Like I would bend down to set something up at camp or I'd bend down to glass for a minute, or I'd kneel down to have a bit of a snack. And it's like, 
They were always just in the perfect place at the right time. I never felt like they were rubbing on my legs. I never thought like they were getting caught up. Some people feel like they ride a little bit low. I wonder if you're in the right size pair of pants. Order, as far as fit goes, order the size of pants that you are. And if, and if you're in a bit, like I wear 36 jeans, but certain brands of like size 36, but certain brands, 36 is too small. So in that case, order a 38. If you're like a loose 34 in Levi's, order a 34. They fit very true to size, but if anything, I would say they're just, just a touch snug for the size. So if you're on the edge, go up one. And remember, they're an athletic fit with a lot of stretch. So even if you're up a size, they're still gonna hug you pretty tight for the size that they are. I wear 38 um, and they fit perfectly. Obviously I wear a belt, but um, I could probably almost get away without one. Um, I don't know what else to say about these. They dry really quickly. They're super quiet. The camo pattern's great. The knee pads are great. Um, again, only 16 hunting days. So as I spend more time in these, I will update you guys as I go. I thought they were going to be a little bit too heavy, but they breathe very well. They almost have like a checked fleece on the, on the inside. I had a pair of Kuyu Chugash, Chugash, I think they were called. And they were like a micro checked fleece on the inside, almost like a very late season pant. They're a great pair of pants too, but that's, I, that's what I thought they were going to be too heavy because of that. They're not. The Apex hoodie is a bit too heavy for early season. I only wore that a couple of days of the Northern BC uh, hunt because it was too hot. Um, that one I think could be thinner for early season hunting. But I think at that point, you're going to wear something like um, the First Light Wick hoodie or a Sitka... Um, core lightweight hoodie, something like that, like a thin merino or a thin synthetic. So I don't think you have the need for like a complicated piece of gear. So as far as these two pieces of gear go, Sitka wins, hands down. It's an extra 40 bucks. I don't give a shit. It beats the first light pants. No questions asked. So here's a little revelation that I had. I, I buy a lot of gear and I try a lot of gear. And what I think, what sets Sitka apart in some ways is its ability to build multifunctional pieces. If you want a purebred whatever, there are better companies to go with. Like if you want a Merino top, go First Light. They're comfortable. They're constructed well. They're not scratchy. The fit is great. They've got great cuffs. The hoods fit well. Um, the thumb loops are nice. Like if you just want something Pure Merino, First Light, hands down, is my favorite. Um, if you want like a pure puffy jacket and it's going to be in dry conditions and you just want an insulation layer, I'm going to say Stone Glacier right now probably has the best puffy jacket weight to warmth ratio on the market. What Sitka excels at is hybrid gear. It's gear that does a couple of different things all at the same time. So it's kind of like a jack of all trades, but master of none. The nice thing about that is as a hunter, you're normally going into mixed circumstances where you're going to encounter several different environmental variables and having gear that can respond to those variables in an adaptable way is really beneficial. And that's the kind of thing that's like lately really stuck out Here's the thing you got to remember. Sitka is owned by Gore. Gore is one of the largest textile manufacturers in the world. I, I know this partly because it's what I, I work with apparel retailers for the most part for what I do for a living. Um, lots of the names that you would recognize are my clients. If you're in Vancouver, you know who I'm talking about probably. Gore is one of the largest apparel retailers and textile manufacturers in the world. The R&D budget of Gore is going to dwarf. I'm talking like 10 X what first light has to spend on R and D even Kuyu or any of the rest of like none of these guys can hold a candle to the R and D department at Sitka. I am not saying buy everything Sitka. What I am saying is that when it comes to hybrid pieces of gear that serve multiple functions at the same time, right now, I think Sitka is winning that race. 
I think where other apparel manufacturers win is when they stay in their lane. Like, hey, we're going to do this one thing and we're going to do it really well. Then they tend to win. So the question you want to ask yourself when you're buying a new piece of gear is like, okay, what do I want out of this piece of gear? Am I going to be using it for the same thing all the time? Or is it going to be serving different functions in my kit, depending on where I'm at in the hunt or what time of year I'm hunting or, you know, um, and depending on the answer to that, that's when we can start to go. I could start to recommend different, uh, apparel retailers for different functions. My last note on that is as we get into this, uh, please contact me with any gear reviews that you would like, who knows, I might've already bought it and used it and just didn't think it was worth doing a review on. Um, or I might be willing to just go pick it up and put it in my kit just to give you guys the review. One of the nice things about doing this podcast and having a YouTube channel is that I've literally bought gear just simply to do a YouTube video on it. Um, you can go look on my channel. I did a review on the Zeiss Conquests versus the Zeiss Victories. And I literally bought two brand new pairs of binoculars just so I could use them both in Arizona for a week, side by side, decide which one was better and sell the other one. So I do it all the time. So let me know if there's anything else that you want some feedback on. But as far as this goes, Sitka, or Sitka Apex smokes the First Light Obsidian. All right, let's get into the hunt plans for 2021. I'm super excited to talk about this topic because I think there are are some creative tips and things I can recommend that are going to help you guys hunt more, or maybe even just prioritize what you want out of hunting uh, in order to book hunts that are more satisfying to whatever particular urges it is that you've got. So let me back up a little bit. For the first part of my hunting career, um, which is like the last eight years, pretty hardcore. I was a day hunter. So I'd either work, was working on a Haida Gwaii and I could go on logging roads after work, or I was back in the lower mainland and I would, you know, knock a day off work every now and then, and just walk up in the mountains and you're back behind Chilliwack or go up to Squamish and just day hunt for blacktail or, or spring bear, whatever the season was. And I did a lot of day hunting and British Columbia is great for that. Then I went on my first like real adventure hunt or backpack hunt or backcountry hunt, whatever you want to call it. And I was like, oh, okay, this is a whole different animal, but it requires a lot more planning. It requires a lot more sacrifice. I have a wife. I have a young daughter. How can I actually facilitate more of these in my life? So once I realized that I wanted more hunting trips in my life and less day hunting, I started thinking at the time I still had a job. So I was somewhat limited by the amount of, I still have, I do have a job now, but I work for myself. I, I, I was a co-founder at the company that I work for. So my schedule is a lot more flexible than it used to be. Um, but I had a limited amount of vacation time that I was able to take. And obviously I still had to dedicate some of that vacation time towards my family. So depending on where you're at your, in your life, financially and family wise, you may have some hard limits that simply can't be breached. And if that's the case, you got to just do the best you can. My recommendation is take care of your wife. And if you're a woman listening to this and you want to go on more hunting trips, take care of your husband. Be open and, and, and considerate when you're planning a hunt. Involve her in the planning because just by allowing her to move the hunt one to two days, one way or another, that may provide enough input for her that she feels like it's not being forced upon her and she's actually part of the planning process and she's a little more open to it. Um, I bring my hunts up to my wife well in advance. We've gotten to the point now where I cleared 2021 early October. I went to her. I'm like, here's the plan. These are the hunts I want to go on. These are how, this is how long I want to be gone. This is the type of budget I'm going to spend on each of these hunts. And we had an open conversation about that and we came to an agreement and she's totally cool. Wasn't always like that. When my daughter was younger and she wasn't as comfortable with me being gone, it was a lot more difficult and I went away less, bottom line. But the more often we've been able to do it and the more support I give her while I'm home and the more understanding I am about the things that she wants to do, the better she is about me going away. So I guess I would just say, approach it as cooperatively as possible and let your partner be part of the planning process because then they're going to feel like they have a voice and that they're participating in the actual 
event as opposed to it just being a bystander and something that just, oh, Jay's just gone two weeks every few months. That being said, I knew I wanted to hunt more than I could working a full-time day job for a boss. That was one of the reasons why I quit and started my own company. I shit you not. It was because I wanted to spend more time hunting. My recommendation to people is find an occupation or find an opportunity to generate income where you are valued for the quality of your work, not the quantity. My value is defined by the quality of my thinking and by the ideas that I come up with and the recommendations that I give to clients. Sometimes it takes 15 minutes to have a stroke of genius. Sometimes it takes 10 hours. Sometimes I work eight hours on a Monday. Sometimes I don't work Monday at all. Sometimes I work all day Sunday. I have the ability to shift my work around. And for the most part, nobody in my life cares how long it takes to do something. They care about the quality of my output. I don't even care if you're a, you're a tradesman, like maybe you're a framer, maybe you're a painter. There are way, I've been a gas fitter. Um, I've worked HVAC. I've done a lot of trades jobs. I was a forestry engineer for 15 years. Even if what you're doing is a, a typical job, there are still ways to construct your environment so that you're getting, you know, piecework, quoting jobs as a total instead of making a quote on a job based on an hourly rate and then finishing it quicker or hiring more people. The tip I'm trying to get across is that if you want to spend more time away from home, you need to find a way to be valued for the quality of your output, not the quantity of hours you put in. Because if you are a, a, a clock puncher, you will only ever make hour in, dollar out. So you will always be limited to how much time you can go away. And maybe that's just a fact of life and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's just the way it is. And if that's the case, you got to operate within those um, restrictions. But if it's not, and if you can think about it, if this is really important to you, then think about it. There are ways to get around this. So that's what I did. It was one of the reasons why I started the company is that I wanted more flexibility. I still work just as much as I always have, maybe more, but I choose when I work now, which allows me to shift my schedule around. Now that was a bunch of context that may or may not be necessary, but when I get into how much I hunt, I, somebody's going to send me the message like, how the fuck do you do that? So I just wanted to give some context. I'm lucky that I make good money doing what I do and I have the flexibility to shift my work around to fit my, my, the needs of my passion, which is backcountry hunting. So up first, end of February, we have a solo goat hunt in Northwestern British Columbia, probably going to be seven, eight days. Then in probably early March, this one is like a 60 to 70%. I know I can do it, but this is one of those things where it'll depend on work and the wife. I've cleared three big hunts with the wife. Spring bear is one of those optional ones. If it comes up and she's not too busy and she doesn't mind me sneaking out for four or five days to run up to Prince George and hunt bear with my bow, I will. That's like a fun hunt for me. It's not super complicated or technical. And it's pretty close and easy to go up there. That one may or may not happen. After that, this is the biggie. Two-week solo backpack sheep. Um, probably in northeastern British Columbia, but like that's like 80% right now. I may put in for some draws in the northwest. And if I can pull something there, I will pivot. The reason I like the Northeast is that I've been there before. I've never been to that. I've never hunted in that particular area of the Northwest where most of the draw tags are. So it produces some complications. However, it also relieves some pressure because it's a draw unit. So we'll probably put in for the draw. And if I draw it, I'll head Northwest. I was originally going to hike in. I've also explored uh, horses getting outfitted. And I've also explored a float plane. I'm not sure where I'm at yet, to be honest with you. I'm not afraid to walk in. I've done really big hikes in before. Um, however, I do have a couple bucks. So if I could drop a few grand and, and put two extra days hunting on my trip instead of walking in, I'd do it. What makes me nervous about the flight is like just getting dropped off in one location. And what if they drop you off right on top of somebody else or they drop you off in that basin and it's just empty? Um, so if I do get a horse or a float plane, I'm kind of probably going to look at a hybrid option, like potentially getting dropped off at one lake 
and plotting a route through several drainages to a different lake with the expectation that I'll get picked up at the far lake unless I find something closer to the first lake and then I can backtrack to get picked up there. Same thing with the horses. I, I'd want an ability to shift my location to some degree. I got dropped off by a jet boat once and it was one of the worst experiences of my life because they just drop you off and you leave. And it was like within two days, I'm like, this area is shit. But they like, you can't go anywhere. So I really, I hesitate to get locked into one area. I really like to be mobile. I've never done a sheep hunt before and I've never done a solo hunt for two weeks. I've done a lot of solo elk hunting, but most of it's bivy hunting. In for three, four days, out for a night. In for three, four days, out for a night. So this, this is one of the reasons why I put this hunt on my list is so that I can execute that challenge. Uh, major hunt number three is probably going to be Montana elk. I, I play the points game in the States a lot. Probably the next podcast or the one after I'm going to start a series on how to hunt in the States for a Canadian. And I'm going to break down all the point systems in all the major Western States where I think it's worth building points, where I don't think it's worth building points. What are your near-term, mid-term and long-term opportunities in each of those States? We're going to get in multiple species, deer, goat, elk, sheep, lots of stuff. So I have quite a few points kicking around in a variety of States and there's a, there's a limited draw tag in Montana that takes four points and I have four points and I'm pretty sure that's what I'm going to go for. I'm just a little still nervous about the whole C one niner and whether or not borders are going to be open next year. So that's not fully locked in, but there will be a 10 day archery elk hunt in September somewhere, 90% Montana, 10% BC. And then I probably will be able to fit in a late season mule deer hunt somewhere, but that's not a guarantee. So the three guarantees are February goat, August sheep, and September elk. The two optionals are March spring bear, sorry, May spring bear, and October, November muley hunt. Now, let me talk a little bit about why I've chosen the hunts that I've chosen this year. So when I went on my elk hunt this year, my hunting partner tapped out after four days and went and sat at a hotel. He was having knee issues, so I don't want to throw him under the bus completely. But what it really shone a light on for me was that I don't want to feel like, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I'm really good at being by myself in the back country. It doesn't, I like it a lot. I have my rough days back there for sure. And you can watch the elk hunting video last year. I was very candid about that, but I like it. Um, and I'm good at it and I can go deep. I've got the fitness level. I've got the mountaineering experience. I've got the land nav experience from being a forestry engineer for 15 years. And as I got closer to the end of the hunt and I wasn't getting an animal and I do want to continue to tell stories. I like filming my hunts. I like sharing these adventures with people. It, I, it occurred to me that you just need a story. That story doesn't necessarily have to be killing an animal. Ideally, that's what it is. But if you plan really audacious hunts, like solo goat hunts in the middle of the snow in the mountains, or two weeks alone by yourself hunting sheep in the Rockies, that is a compelling ass story. That is interesting to me. And that's the type of stories I want to tell. So I realized after that, Instead of trying to concoct hunts where I thought I had a high degree of success, I started to solely focus on creating hunts that had a high, a high degree of challenge and risk and adventure. And whatever you know degree of success of killing the animal that was in there is just what I was going to take. So that's where you'll, that's why I've made the hunts the way that I have this year. Cause I'm trying to push myself. I'm trying to push my own boundaries. I want to see what I'm capable of in the back country. Um, so yeah, so that's the plan, man. The other thing is I think it's good. The preparation and the, and the meltdowns afterwards meltdown is just a term for like a debrief. Um, the preparation and the debrief afterwards, I think it's going to be really interesting content. Like, I think you guys are going to be interested in what I'm taking on a goat hunt. What type of ice axe am I using? How did I feel about how that ice axe fared? What type of snowshoes do I decide upon? How much food do I take? Was it enough food? Should I add up more food? Um, what clothing did I bring? How did I heat my water? What stove did I use? Was it, did the, did the cold temperatures affect my stove? Like there's the more complicated a hunt is the more 
uh, infinite the amount of topics I can cover and shed light on for you guys and for myself. So that's a big motivating factor for me when I'm choosing my hunts. Like, I have no problem. I, I enjoy going on a guided hunt from time to time. But like the story is not nearly as compelling. It's not as interesting. It's not as engaging. It's not as charismatic. So the goal for this year is just like, yeah, man, as nuts and hardcore as I can possibly make it. I think that's it for this week. I'm going to wrap it up. As always, you can find this podcast on the Beyond the Kill podcast network, my YouTube channel, Mindful Hunter, and you can stay in touch with me on Instagram at mindful underscore hunter. You can email me, j at mindfulhunter.com. Go to my website for show notes and any other um, information. Let me know any questions, comments, or concerns. I'd love to chat with you guys and, and hear about what you want to know about. Um, and if any of you still have tags in your pocket this season, good luck.